Hello everyone, good morning. Welcome to CPPR webinar series. Uh, I'm Sharon Susan Koshi. Um, the CPPR webinar series is organized by Center for Public Policy Research in Kochi. CPPR is a public policy think tank in Kochi, Kerala, engaging in a range of sectors like urban governance, mobility, education, livelihood, governance, and law, security, and international relations. We have been a pivotal partner in furthering engagements with governments and diplomats of various nations. To know more about what we do, please do visit our website www.cdpr.in and our social media accounts. Today we are going to dive into a very interesting topic that is also the flavor of the time, the G20. In today's webinar, we're here to discuss one of the issue areas that India could push as a priority area in its upcoming presidency of the G20 in 2023. I'm Sharon Susan Koshi, Research Associate at CBPR, and today I will be in conversation with Mr. Niranjan Marjani, an independent political analyst and researcher based in Vadodara. Niranjan specialized in international relations and geopolitics. His areas of work are India's foreign policy, South Asia, Southeast Asia, Indo-Pacific region, Central Asia, and Middle East and international publications and think tanks. Uh, he's also a consulting editor with the Kutni the Espanol, a New Delhi-based magazine on international relations published in Spanish. He also offers consultation as a political risk analyst to Indian and foreign corporate entities. Welcome, Naranjan. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Sure. Now, uh, uh, to get into a little bit of a background about the topic that we're going to discuss today, uh, you know, as per World Bank, the blue economy is defined as a sustainable utilization of oceanic resources for economic growth, improved livelihoods and employment. Moreover, prioritizing the preservation of the health and well-being of the ocean ecosystem. Uh, the G20 accounts for over 80% of global GDP, with the forum making up around 45% of the world's coastlines, wherever 21% of its uh, econo exclusive economic zones exist as regions of immense prominence within the global arena. Nevertheless, uh, challenges pertaining to marine fisheries, offshore oil and gas, uh, climate threats, seabed mining, pollution, marine litter and debris have led to increased depletion of ocean health and marine resources where there is an urgent call to you know, unite for a framework to target the transition into a universal blue economy to amplify sustainable economic growth within the G20. As the current G20 2022 president and burgeoning archipelago, in Indonesia's G20 efforts seek to address the blue carbon, marine waste alongside the blue economy, where it has also called for initiatives of other G20 nations. Indonesia is also looking to enhance the role of blue economy within public and uh, foreign policy agendas. Here, the blue economy is estimated to double by 2030 uh, to reach about three trillion US dollars, where there is an succeeding, where there is an emphasis on uh, conservation and maritime sustainability. Additionally, India, the succeeding G20 president, has promulgated his uh, efforts into publishing the blue economy vision 2025 via. Uh, the Federation of Indian Chambers of Commerce and Industry, looking into the requirement for multifaceted policies that are not limited to maritime agendas. It also aims to target food security, poverty, unemployment rates, climate resilience, climate diplomacy, and amplify socioeconomic growth. Although G20 nations carry importance for connecting the blue economy to economic growth within the region, economic scarcities, inefficient planning and implementation, lack of resources, sustainable finance, and more contribute to the various challenges pertaining to the hampering of blue and economic growth. Due to the recent trends of a looming climate crisis, the exhaustion of marine resources and coastal degradation, alongside a recovering world economy within the post-pandemic age, the G20 Forum is expected to target the con convergence of economic growth and blue economy. It is in this context that we are hosting this webinar today to get into the specifics of blue economy as a sector that can give Philip to not just economic recovery and growth, but also sustainability initiatives. 
So Nirenjan, we are at an interesting juncture in history now, perhaps one that our generation has definitely not anticipated. We are at a crossroads of post-pandemic economic recovery and uh, governments looking to kickstart many sectors, uh, which were severely affected by the pandemic. On the other hand, the world, particularly South Asia, is also going through one of its worst climate change induced disaster phases. So in this context, what roles do you reckon sustainable and regenerative tourism, which is one of the important blue economy plans, could play within the post pandemic age where tourism recovery is at its peak? Uh, indeed, uh, it's a very important question. And of course, uh, uh, these are very challenging times because as we are coming out of uh, the pandemic and uh, economic recovery is uh, a priority, but at the same time, the climate change, the challenges posed by climate change uh, also need to be addressed. So uh, it's very uh, a delicate balancing that is needed between, uh, you know, uh, economic recovery and uh, addressing climate change. And here where I think blue economy uh, does play an important part and like all the other economic sectors, blue economy has also been affected by the COVID-19 pandemic and it's also uh, looking at recovery. But uh, what I think about the question uh, about question uh, regarding to the tourism is that uh, G20 is already taking uh, steps towards uh, this. Uh, and uh, I think in 2020, the United Nations World Tourism Organization uh, prioritized uh, sustainable tourism as uh, one of the goals uh, and for which uh, G20 countries also took initiative during their summits uh, from 2020 onwards. And uh, that trend has been continuing. Uh, see, the thing is uh, not just for India, but uh, across the world, blue economy and uh, policies regarding to blue economies, they are still emerging and evolving. So same applies to tourism as well. When we talk about uh, sustainable tourism, uh, it, it is still an evolving sector, uh, which uh, all the countries, all the concerned countries, they will need to formulate uh, policies whereby they could offer uh, sustainable tourism. And because uh, the a number of countries and particularly number of uh, members of the G20, uh, they depend on tourism as their, uh, uh, as a important component of their economy. So for them, it is very important. I think it has uh, got to do more with uh, uh, governance and regulations that uh, G20 countries will have to come up. And uh, if, uh, uh, like if I talk from India's perspective, then uh, while, uh, while uh, you know, describing blue economy, India uh, did mention one thing uh, while formulating policy is that uh, there is no, a uniform definition of blue economy yet at global level and uh, because it differs from country to country and every country has to come up uh, with its own uh, definition with its own concept of blue economy so again i think uh, it depends on uh, g20 as a group but also uh, it depends on individual countries to come up with their own uh, according to their own situation and own challenges uh, so i think this is where but uh, as a group, G20 has already started taking steps in this direction. And uh, like even uh, the current summit, which is being held in Indonesia, uh, it has also prioritized uh, blue economy as one of the areas of focus during this summit, uh, because Indonesia is also a major tourist destination. And at the same time, it is exposed to uh, uh, threats of climate change. So it is very important that Indonesia takes up this issue and takes it forward because it started in 2020, uh, sustainable tourism and particular focus on G20. So uh, now I think uh, uh, more needs to be done uh, at the level of individual countries coming up with their own uh, concepts of uh, uh, sustainable tourism and also uh, more focus in uh, upcoming summits uh, is needed. And I think India will play uh, a major role because India has been prioritizing blue economy uh, in its uh, foreign policy as well as in domestic policy and also as a component of its economy. So I think uh, when India takes over the presidency of G20 next year, uh, blue economy will indeed be an important uh, 
a major area of focus and uh, india would push forward uh, this uh, uh, you know goal of sustainable tourism along with of course other uh, goals and other uh, other factors that are involved in blue economy Okay. Uh, so I was interestingly uh, coming across this article by the World Economic Forum right before uh, the presidency of Indonesia, basically last year around this time. And the WEF had certain, you know, recommendations as to certain areas to focus on when it comes to the economy. Because, you know, ever since we were think, talking about uh, post-COVID recovery, there was this talk about whether... Um, I mean, there's, there's no question that sustainability should be the underlying factor, uh, but also how should we build it up and what are the issue areas that one should focus on. And they were particularly stressing on the importance of uh, maritime renewable energy sources. I mean, yes, we are coming across technological advancements that, uh, you know, um, would render fossil fuel based energy production, maybe not as uh, harmful to the climate anymore, but still we are talk in, in talks about how we can turn attention or maybe you know, more fo focus more on renewable energies that can be harvested from the maritime region. So how is India faring in this uh, particular sector and uh, how can maritime renewable energy be say the future for energy production? Uh, India is one of the uh, major advocates of, uh, uh, you know, addressing the challenge of climate change and India uh, is like a signatory to uh, Paris uh, Accord of 2016 and also uh, one of the founder members of International Solar Alliance. So India is very much uh, involved at international level in uh, promoting renewable energy. And uh, if uh, I would uh, talk about uh, the steps taken by India, then uh, uh, I would specifically focus on uh, what India is doing in its uh, neighborhood, uh, how mm -hmm. promoting uh, renewable energy in the neighborhood. So uh, blue economy and uh, climate change, renewable energy, it's becoming uh, an important part of India's neighborhood first policy. Uh, but at the same time, there are certain challenges when uh, we talk about uh, India's role in the neighborhood or in South Asia as a region, because uh, South Asia remains one of the most disintegrated regions in the world. And uh, therefore it's very, uh, at times, uh, it is difficult to uh, formulate policies for a region as a whole. And even for India, it has been challenging to uh, uh, take a regional perspective, but uh, instead of, uh, uh, you know, uh, instead of letting all these uh, geopolitical and strategic challenges uh, come in the way, India is taking steps towards sub-regional cooperation. And I would like to quote examples of India's sub-regional cooperation with Sri Lanka and Maldives. Now, both these countries, Sri Lanka and Maldives also, they are major tourist destinations. Uh, their economy depends a lot on the foreign exchange, which is uh, generated by tourism. So these countries have been affected due to COVID-19 because of travel restrictions. And at the same time, climate change also poses a threat to their economy because tourism is disrupted. And uh, uh, now India, uh, as India's neighbors, so India is taking, uh, has formed a trilateral cooperation with Sri Lanka and Maldives, although it is in the strategic area, but uh, these countries are uh, moving towards cooperating in area of renewable energy as well, because uh, now in, in, two, in March this year, in March 2022, India and uh, Sri Lanka signed an agreement to develop a 100 megawatt solar power plant in Trincomalee. And earlier in 2021, India had extended a 100 million uh, dollar line of credit to finance solar power plants in Sri Lanka. So India is, uh, uh, India is very much uh, taking note of uh, the climate, uh, the threat of climate change that Sri Lanka is facing and uh, India is helping uh, that country to move towards uh, renewable energy. The same is case with uh, Maldives. In April this year, India and Maldives proposed two memoranda of understanding. Uh, one is on energy cooperation uh, and other on transmission interconnection under one sun, one world, one grid. Now, all these three countries, they are part of uh, Paris Climate Accord and International Solar Alliance. So, uh, 
see tourism and blue economy they contribute significantly to the economies of sri lanka and maldives and uh, adverse effect of climate change are felt by uh, both these sectors because it uh, leads to uh, loss of uh, income loss of foreign exchange and at the same time it leads to food insecurity so i think and uh, particularly if i uh, uh, go back a little bit then after the 2004 tsunami uh, there was need to feel uh, to address this challenge on an emergency basis because india sri lanka and maldives were among the worst affected countries because of tsunami so it becomes imperative for all the three countries to cooperate more in this area uh, they are cooperating already india has started take, uh, taking steps so that uh, the economies of both uh, sri lanka and maldives do not suffer due to climate change by uh, assisting them in moving towards renewable energy but uh, still there is a lot of scope for cooperation in this direction and i think uh, the more these countries engage with themselves the more they discuss uh, their specific uh, challenges then i think it would be better and india and overall south asia would also be able to address uh, these challenges in a better manner but i think uh, there have been uh, there has been some effort and uh, i think the countries are taking steps in the right direction that's what i can say about india and in uh, the sub regional cooperation with sri lanka and maldives right thank you thank you for that uh, uh, insight into what india does in the neighborhood in terms of uh, you know cooperation on renewable energy and so on uh, this makes me actually uh, think back uh, to the fact that everything in blue economy is actually interlinked right i mean we, at, at one uh, on one hand we talk about how deep sea mining and exploration of resources is very necessary and that in turn feeds into our renewable energy source on the other so um, i was actually uh, hoping that you could give a little bit of insight into um, what accounting framework perhaps we can use in the sense you know when we talk about gdp and the uh, and the contribution of various sectors to gdp Uh, we have a certain calculation that's already in, uh, you know, uh, that's already framed and that's already implemented. But when it comes to blue economy, one of the main challenges that uh, we face is how do we calculate the contribution in terms of, uh, you know, the amount of money that's contributed in terms of ecosystem services and the kinds of jobs that are generated. How do we, you know, account that in the national uh, framework? Uh, it is already being accounted because. Uh... as far as india's uh, uh, you know gdp is concerned uh, at present blue economy contributes to about 4% of uh, india's gdp so there are uh, accounting uh, procedures in place and around uh, uh, more than 4 million people are involved in blue economy and whose livelihoods depend on blue economy particularly those living in the coastal areas so uh, they are more than 4 million of people who depend on blue economy so uh, that is already and uh, uh, also thing is uh, even for india and as worldwide uh, blue economy is termed as a sunrise sector it's an emerging uh, sector economy and india is still in the process of uh, evolving all the frameworks uh, uh, regarding the blue economy which is uh, mentioned in the vision for new india 2030 where blue economy is the uh, sixth area thematic area where india is uh, now focusing on so this uh, things they include one of the points that uh, uh, that are focused in this theme are a national accounting framework for the blue economy uh, it is still in the development stage because uh, it also states that uh, more training is necessary about uh, blue economy so the government is uh, right now uh, focusing on the training uh, training area like uh, we need more professionals uh, to be involved in this blue economy so that uh, there is uh, more accountability they it is uh, you know uh, accounted properly and also you know to uh, these professionals they could uh, forward india's interests at international level they could take part in discussions and negotiations so uh, we need more of such professionals and for that training and development is necessary which is identified as one of the uh, 
first steps to be taken while we uh, while we include blue economy and to increase uh, its proportion in india's gdp right now you. yeah And, uh, yes, please. Um, uh, yes, so I was also uh, referring to some of the examples that we can see internationally, right, when it comes to blue economy, because uh, yes, India is still in its infancy when we really think about it, it's still a sunrise sector, like you were saying. Um, but world over, there are examples of how it's already been implemented and how there are already established ent industries in, in the blue economy sector. Uh, say in Scandinavian countries like uh, Norway or the, or the US or UK, um, even there, they one challenge that they face is with regards to the emerging technologies, right? Uh, especially when it comes to renewables. So I, I think India can actually adapt certain lessons that we can learn from, you know, already established sectors elsewhere in the world. And again, examples like Indonesia, Norway, the UK, Brazil, US, they're all undertaking domestic policies with regards to blue economy as well. Um, however, we don't have one overarching framework. Uh, like, for example, UN's various conventions uh, stipulate that you adapt this into domestic policies, but we don't have that sort of a, you know, overarching framework when it comes to blue economy. So perhaps uh, what I'm hoping that India could do in this next uh, presidency is to have that sort of a framework in place, push for an agenda like that. So how important do you think is to have a global consensus on, uh, you know, accounting for blue economy and the contributions of blue economy to the world GDP? Uh, it is very important. And like I mentioned earlier, uh, India did uh, highlight this fact that there is no uniform definition of blue economy as yet. And each country has its own definition, of course, depending upon uh, that country's situation and the challenges uh, they face. But uh, yes, uh, as uh, president of G20, India could push for, uh, uh, you know, a uniform uh, regulation or particularly I would like to point out uh, governance and regulation. Uh, these things are uh, very much needed at global level when we talk about blue economy and if uh, there is going to be cooperation among countries on in the area of blue economy so as of now uh, like you rightly mentioned there is no uh, uniform no overarching uh, framework for blue economy uh, globally or even uh, you know region wise so uh, india uh, i think because when we uh, let's uh, talk about uh, uh, like india's policy towards indo pacific so one uh, factor and one point that india stresses is the rules based order so while it uh, it refers to strategic area the geopolitics uh, this can also apply in the case of blue economy like rules based order i mean uh, proper institutional mechanism which can have governance and regulatory framework uh, because uh, uh, this uh, challenge was particularly highlighted during the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, when uh, COVID-19 pandemic uh, affected the fishery sector most because uh, the uh, fishing stopped, uh, it affected livelihoods of millions of people across the world. And also in terms of, uh, uh, you know, surveillance, uh, it became uh, difficult. Uh, because illegal fishing also increased during uh, that period. So that is a challenge which, uh, which uh, you know, those uh, fisher folk who are, whose livelihood depends on fishing, uh, they face and it ultimately affects economies of a number of countries because uh, uh, like India, many countries, they depend on fishing as uh, an important part of their economy. So this, uh, but... Uh, Due to reduced surveillance, uh, the illegal fishing increased and uh, there was no, not much uh, that could be done during this period. So a need is felt and still it is important that uh, countries come together or groups like G20, they uh, discuss this factor on an emergency basis because it is directly related to food security. And uh, I think uh, India should look into this matter as a president of G20, India must uh, uh, ask all the other members of G20 to uh, cooperate and come up with uh, some common or some uniform governance mechanism. And 
I think more attention needs to be paid towards uh, surveillance of the seas so that uh, this illegal fishing uh, can be stopped or at least controlled or reduced. So I think India can take steps in this direction as a president of G20. And uh, if blue economy is the area of focus, then uh, governance and regulation, these are, I think, uh, the most important factors. Of course, the uh, every country will have its own uh, uh, you know, uh, own details about uh, the blue economy, but uh, still overall, if we talk at global level and regional level, then I think governance, uh, regulatory mechanism, institutional mechanism, these things are uh, still lacking. Although uh, United Nations and uh, uh, other uh, international institutions are working in this area, but still, like you said, overarching framework is needed. And this is where India can come into picture and India can play a major role uh, by emphasizing and by, uh, uh, you know, by uh, asking all the other members to yeah. come up with such framework. Yeah, it is true. I, I mean, I'm uh, quickly recalling how uh, from 2012, when this uh, idea of blue economy was first thrown into EU, how they prioritize job creation because they have just uh, just got done with the 2008 crisis, and they, they, yes. their priority for them was, you know, employing more people, uh, bettering people's, uh, I mean, bettering the economy. So job creation was the priority. As versus now, it's more about sustainability because. From 2015 onwards, we hear about the Paris Agreement and how you know you can contribute more to climate mitigating climate risks and so on. So now I think we are more banking on the plan of sustainability. But again, blue economy is so vast and so diverse, so versatile. There are so many things you, you know each country can prioritize in their domestic policies. Definitely, um, that brings me to one important question again about climate financing because no matter how much you talk about climate change and mitigating these risks. If you don't contribute it to in a you know in a financial level, then those talks just remain talks. So climate financing is something that has been increasingly talked about at G20, as well as at other climate-linked uh, multilateral fora like COP26. And as, as we are speaking, COP27 is undergoing in Egypt. And what role do you think uh, you know sustainable finance can play within economic growth and blue economy in relation to the G20? I it can play a very important role and uh, also uh, if i recall correctly then uh, sustainable development goal number 14 which pertains to blue economy uh, it remains one of the least financed programs or projects uh, in the united nations so uh, sustainable finance is something that uh, member countries and uh, regional organizations they can certainly look into but and what i think is a concerted efforts are needed in this direction like uh, governments of course uh, will have a major role to play but at the same time uh, involving private players ngos and also citizens i think that could help uh, in raising awareness and also in uh, financing uh, this uh, sustainable uh, economy blue economy so i think uh, it it does, this is one area which, uh, and I think financing is uh, the most important area because uh, uh, without that, we cannot have uh, new technologies uh, uh, which can help uh, increase, uh, you know, sustainability and also the productivity of the blue economy, uh, new techniques and also uh, improving lives of uh, those who depend on blue economy. So it is all linked and uh, in fact, uh, this is something all the countries, uh, they need to focus on because uh, uh, it's not just India's problem, it's a universal problem. Overall, uh, at global level, blue economy remains uh, one of the least financed uh, uh, you know, projects. And despite uh, we do uh, hear discussions about uh, climate change, sustainable development and everything, but still when it comes to financing, uh, uh, not much has been done until now. So okay. this is uh, one area that needs focused and concerted efforts from all the governments and other agencies as well, I think can help in this direction. So basically, because uh, see, the thing is again, the blue economy, uh, like we said, is a sunrise sector. Uh, I think it is necessary to first create awareness about uh, the blue economy and importance of blue economy. 
particular because uh, those who uh, those who do not uh, like people who are uh, living in coastal areas and in island countries i think they are more aware about all these challenges and the importance of blue economy uh, but uh, those who don't live there those who don't feel those effects uh, as much as uh, the people living in island countries i think more awareness is needed to be created among uh, those people and only then because uh, see uh, like i mentioned a blue economy contributes to 4% and uh, the percentage can increase its proportion can increase only when people are aware and people uh, get involved more than they are getting involved so uh, it is all again linked like we need more professionals working in blue economy and we need to create more awareness so that people uh, they get to know and they get contribute towards uh, developing blue economy so i think financing remains a major challenge even today and uh, also this area that needs to be discussed uh, at global level because like uh, sustainable development goal number 14 itself remains uh, under financed as of now so uh, even united nations and all the other countries so they need to again focus on this and again we come to the same point uh, about an overarching framework or governance and regulatory framework so until uh, you know that is established that is in place uh, these things uh, would not go uh, much uh, far. Uh, that's what I believe. So overall framework is needed, which uh, can take care of financing and all introducing new technology and addressing the challenges. So uh, I think that should be the first step when we talk of uh, finance or any other factor which is necessary to uh, you know develop blue economy. That's what. I think. Thank you, Narajan. Uh, I have a last couple of questions. This okay. is especially with regards to India's domestic policies. So one uh, flagship program that uh, India has undertaken is SAGA, Security and Growth for All in the Region, right? Introduced in 2015. So this is, uh, again, this is a lot to do with how our relationship with the neighbors and how we envision a sort of uh, um, security architecture for the region. So how is Sagar's uh, vision fitting into blue economy aspects and uh, ideals? Uh, see, Sagar uh, it does fit into blue economy aspect because now since uh, because of globalization, the economies of all the countries are interlinked. So we cannot isolate any one country and we cannot say that uh, any event taking place in that country uh, will not affect us and climate change is uh, one such challenge that uh, it affects everyone so if uh, some countries particularly the island countries they are affected by climate change then it is going to uh, affect india as well and uh, that's why india because of of course uh, regional challenges uh, and if regional framework uh, has not been successful india has uh, uh, taken a path of uh, sub-regional cooperation and also this applies to other countries in the Indian Ocean region as well uh, when we talk about uh, the Sagar security and growth for all in the region. Yeah. Uh, so India has been uh, like cooperating with countries like uh, Mauritius and Seychelles as well and uh, also with uh, Southeast Asian countries but uh, uh, again I think they uh, India needs to work closer and all these countries, they need to come together, particularly focusing on uh, blue economy, because uh, I think even now uh, the focus is on, uh, I think, isolated uh, areas like uh, economic cooperation and strategic cooperation that has been uh, major areas of focus and uh, blue economy, although uh, we do, uh, its importance has increased and we do hear about it a lot, but still uh, a lot of work needs to be done and uh, I think more attention needs to be paid to blue economy because that's a, uh, that is a challenge and which uh, we cannot wait to address. Uh, so I think that should be addressed uh, on a priority basis along with of course uh, cooperation in other areas but uh, yeah. like India has, uh, has been taking steps in its neighborhood India could uh, take the same steps uh, with other countries as well and uh, 
like coming up uh, with this sub regional cooperation maybe india could initiate uh, some kind of uh, cooperation or some kind of uh, uh, you know institutional mechanism which addresses a uh, blue economy exclusively maybe uh, one uh, uh, area we could start from especially when it comes to the region would be from bimstech because yes. neobengal has that huge yes. potential yes. in terms of it has all aspects when we talk about the blue economy right so you know maybe from a regional level you can you know have that framework done and uh, maybe expand that to inter regional cooperation because asean is again a huge yes. area in terms of uh, resources ocean resources so uh, i feel like maybe inter regional uh, and multi uh, lateral fora uh, that sort of a setup would uh, enable uh, engagements more fruitfully um this again when you when you were mentioning about the geostrategic position of uh, this particular region uh, especially in india's neighborhood i am uh, i am forced to recall this thing from the uh, fiji report i think uh, it's on um, this particular geostrategic axis right from seychelles singapore to samoa and this is again and again repeated in india's vision document is very so i am just wondering in terms of blue economy how important is this geostrategic uh, axis uh it is very much important and i think uh, like you mentioned uh, cooperation between uh, different regions uh, there is also huge potential uh, i think in that case it uh, becomes even uh, more important and uh, what uh, uh, you know when we talk of cooperation uh, all the stakeholders they need to overcome all this uh, geopolitical challenges or uh, disputes that uh, they may have because uh, you know this climate change is a, a non traditional security threat and it's transnational yeah. so at least uh, consensus must be formed in this area that uh, how can we circumvent our uh, geopolitical challenges or even uh, disagreements that countries may have among themselves because there are uh, disagreements in every region i mean even in uh, southeast asia there are every region has uh, its own uh, geopolitical challenges uh, but then can these countries form any consensus uh, uh, you know ignoring their uh, geopolitical disputes uh, i think that is the most important factor and i think uh, in case of south asia that has been a major impediment while addressing a common challenge uh, like climate change uh, so that's why we are you know forced to think in other directions like Uh, a sub regional cooperation or like focusing more on bimstech rather than on south asia so uh, this is uh, something that uh, again i don't know it if it would be addressed in near future but uh, at least like you mentioned and suggested uh, yes bimstech and asean they could take initiative to jointly address uh, this challenge and to jointly work in the area of uh, blue economy because uh of course bay of bengal and uh, the southeast asia they have huge potential and uh huge coastline every country has so uh, this is one area which uh, of course uh, the interregional cooperation can uh, take place prioritizing a uh, blue economy and this Even needs that, to be done uh... because uh, uh usually uh, strategic and economic areas are uh, focused more but uh, then blue economy forms an important component of economy of uh, at least uh, this region uh, bay of bengal region and southeast asia so uh, yes uh, that framework can be established uh, by these countries at least if not at uh, other global level but uh, that could be a good start in the area of blue economy and given that big stack region and asean um are in fact figuring in g20 maybe g20 could be the way to you know uh, making that yes, happen yes so, yes uh, i think yeah that will make such a discussion within the g20 even more pertinent perhaps um so i guess uh, and also have... you know uh, uh, bimstek and asean i mean they are since neighboring regions i mean they can formulate those policies uh, they can uh, formulate those policies easily because of uh, similarities because uh, yeah. if we consider g20 countries then not all the countries are from the same region they are from different yeah. parts of the world each country has its own challenges and formulates uh, policies accordingly but uh, 
since there is similarity and uh, uh, bimstek and uh, asean since uh, they are neighboring regions i think they are uh, more uh, you know they could be more efficient in this regard that's what i think maybe this is naive of me to ask this but uh, given the fact that we india uh, is the second largest fish producer in the world how is this still a sunrise sector is something that i am not able to comprehend uh, because uh, because still you know our percentage is uh, very less i mean we are second largest but fishery sector is considered as a still a sunrise sector because we uh, there is need to work on the technological aspect the training of the fisher folk introducing uh, new techniques particularly with regard to storage and transportation right. there needs to be a lot of work done in this area which uh, is not yet developed so in terms of volume yes we are the second largest uh, producer of fish but uh, in terms of you know marketing and distribution there is still uh, a lot of uh, work to be done particularly storage and uh, transportation even though we are major exporters of mm. fish but still uh, infrastructure wise this sector needs attention uh, okay. that's what i can say and uh, that is not in place right now so uh, the infrastructure needs more attention rather than volume of course volume wise we do contribute but uh, if uh, infrastructure is developed then uh, this percentage could go up and india could even uh, do better in fishery sector would you say that our uh, you know the uh, flagship programs in the sector like the pradhan mantri matsya sampada yojana which has this ecosystem approach to fisheries would rather have that sort of an effect eventually in the long term at least you know have that infrastructure built in r and d innovation going in um, stored storage facilities done so all of that would uh, you know at least in the long term or in the medium term have that sort of a, you know development because when you compare to any other agricultural allied sectors in india fisheries is growing at a much faster rate yes and yes. so investing in this sector would be wiser on our part and also for those countries who have cross cost lines and they have that potential uh, it does because fisheries and aquaculture sector has uh, increased at a greater rate than any other sector and exports have also increased uh, much more in last uh, 15 years like in 2005 2006 uh, the exports were 7200 crores and now in 2020 2021 it's uh, 43000 crores so uh, it is uh, yes it would be wise to invest more in this sector and uh, research and development and infrastructure like you mentioned uh, because uh, it has a lot of potential and already it is contributing uh, to the economy and uh, giving livelihoods to uh, like more than 4 million people so of course uh, with more uh, efforts with more uh, you know concentration and financing and infrastructure development this sector uh, does have potential to grow even uh, further and it could contribute significantly to india's exports like although right now it is contributing but still it would contribute significantly to india's exports so Uh, uh yes uh, more infrastructure development will push uh, fisheries sector forward uh correct me if i am wrong on this when i was going through the uh the document on blue economy the vision that india the draft policy uh framework that we had put out in uh, march of 2022 uh i found that three sectors are really focused on one is national security uh and then environmental sustainability and economic growth uh, however i found a lot of mentions on you know programs for national security as well as uh, economic growth because you are talking about specifically what can be done in fishery sector or what can be done in allied sectors such as aquaculture how can we incentivize it and even when it comes to national security you're talking about how international communication can be done how strategic communication can be done but however i found very little on sustainability plan of it i mean it's almost as a footnote to some of these programs so um perhaps that's because india already has so many programs in with regards to sdgs particularly uh, you know that falls under different categories of sdgs is is it is it because we're not uh, uh, we don't want to overlap jurisdictions between various ministries and various programs of these ministries or is it because we are actually missing out on the 
you know, sustainability plank of it. What do you think uh, is happening? No, actually, India's uh, blue economy vision document it does ally itself with uh, sustainable development goals. But uh, yes, uh, like it's an emerging sector, India needs to pay more attention to sustainability as well, and it uh, goes across uh, various uh, sectors. So, like you mentioned, there is hardly any uh, anything about sustainability in that uh, document. So, sure, India could. Uh, look forward to this and i think uh, also this is a draft policy framework yeah. so uh, i think there is scope for uh, you know additions or improvements in this uh, it is uh, a draft and yeah. uh, i think there could still be uh, india could add sustainability factor or focus more in this area i think if uh, there are any amendments to this draft so <laughs> I'm sure all these concerns were, you know, conveyed by the stakeholders, I'm sure, yes, because sure. this was a very consultative uh, discussion that, uh, yes. you know, ensued after the draft was published and was open for consultation. Um, but yeah, but I'm, I'm sure that these were concerned, that these concerns were conveyed. But uh, again, the draft would actually, you know, um, send out a message that these are our focus areas. And I felt like perhaps yes. sustainability yes. should have given, you know, a little bit more importance yes, yes. there. Uh, and I completely understand if it's really because we don't want to overlap jurisdictions because that's something that we always point out in India because there are so many ministries yes. uh, concerned with so many things that are of the same nature and yes. same sector. So maybe they want to avoid that here and they want to give flagship programs their due importance and uh, you know have that focused uh, uh, priority as well. Um, and uh, yeah, so again... Uh, I feel like blue economy has so much potential when it comes to um, uplifting, catapulting almost our uh, uh, economy to greater heights because um, we, we are a peninsular country at the end of the day. Yes. We are surrounded by oceans and seas on all three ends. And uh, I mean, yes, with opportunities come challenges as well. Uh, but this is one major opportunity that we must, uh, you know, cash in on. Uh, so I guess, Niranjan, we have come to uh, the end of that discussion and uh, it was really nice, uh, you know, talk about blue economy, this emerging sector in India and world over, in fact. And uh, uh, we thank you for engaging with us for the past hour or so. Uh, thank you for inviting me and uh, uh, it's my pleasure to participate in this uh, discussion on uh, such an important topic of blue economy. So thank you. It was a very good discussion. Yeah. Yeah, for yeah. Uh, thank you also to all the people who have logged in and uh, you know listened to this and will listen to this um, and please make uh, note of your comments or uh, you know questions any if you have and should you have any questions and queries you can actually direct them in our uh, uh, email IDs or our social media handles I'll make sure that I'll pass it on to Mirajan and uh, you'll definitely get an answer or you know, yeah. clarification on your doubts uh, at CBPR, we look forward to have uh, more of such fruitful engagements with you all um, through our webinars, podcasts, and conferences. Uh, please follow our website and social media handles for further updates. With this, I'd like to formally close today's proceedings. Thank you, everyone.